Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Noor Kyle. And I am her faithful sidekick, Mushtaq Ali. <laughs> Thank you to all of you for joining us, whether you're here live or you're watching on YouTube on the replay. So happy to have you here. It's uh, hopefully it'll be a lively conversation this evening. Um, of course, we have to do our little YouTube spiel where we invite you to support our work by helping us grow our channel primarily. And you can do that by subscribing to our channel. You can do that by liking this video. You can do that by commenting and joining the conversation that way. Elsewhere, you can join us on Facebook. We have an active group, our uh, Nine Sided Circle Forum. And we always want to encourage people to join our email list because in this crazy world, you never know what's going to happen where YouTube or Facebook could just crap out. How do we stay in touch with one another? That's how we do it. So um, what else should I add, Mushtaq? Um, we're a lot of fun to talk to. Yes. You have an opportunity to talk to either or both of us um by yeah. signing up for a private consultation mm -hmm. we are consulting dervishes yep yeah and i think both of us have uh one slot open right now i just had one open up this week yes i have one more spot open and do not be afraid to reach out and see if you you might want to hang out with me. Doesn't matter that there's one spot left. What we're doing is trying to figure out if we can have a good fit for an ongoing working relationship. And that means taking the plunge, being brave, finding out. Other than that, we operate entirely on your donations. And uh, we are ever so grateful to them. And we would ask you that if you have any spare change laying about, I recommend looking underneath the cushions of your couch and in the console in your car between the seats. Great place to find spare change. And if you do find any and you don't need it for anything more important like food or rent or a cup of coffee, feel free to send it along to us. And for those of you who have done so already, Thank you very, very much for that. Yeah, we, we can't even you know. begin to express how meaningful it is to us that you're willing to support us in this work. So yay, you guys. Thank you, thank you. And another way to support us is to share our work. You know? Yes. Tell everybody how cool we are, <laughs> even if we're not. So we have all of that to share. Thank you so much for taking time to listen. And this evening, Oh, we are going to be talking about something. Some weird shit. Yeah. That, you know, we were inspired to talk about because it's always a good reminder to reflect on why we're here. Why are mm. we here? What are we doing together? Why do we spend this time together each week? So we are going to be addressing the idea, the practice, the experience of annihilation of the trance. Whew. Big stuff. Heavy. Yeah. And it's something that we all must walk through to continue forward on this path. So where shall we begin, Mushtaq? Well, let's talk about, there is this word that gets tossed around. The word is fana. It's usually translated as annihilation. It's not the best translation for it, but it's, it's very common to translate it into English like that. I think a more accurate translation would be cessation. Fana is a word that anyone who has read, you know, academic Sufi literature or hung out with 
more traditional Sufis, this is a word that comes up quite often. Yeah. And it usually comes up in the idea of uh, extinction of the ego, perhaps, cessation of the ego, annihilation of the ego. Um, and most Sufis, in, in my, uh, as far as I can see, use a map that goes like this. First, you create Fana Fishef, which is annihilation in the personality of your teacher. Then, you once you have accomplished that, you move on to uh, Fanafi Pir, annihilation in the founder of your particular tradition or tariqa. So maybe in Jalaluddin Rumi or Abdul Qadir Jalani or uh, Ibn Arabi or any of that sort of thing. Then, you once you achieve that, you move on to Fanafi Rasul which is annihilation in the personality of the prophet. And then finally, you get to fana fila, which is annihilation in God. There is a, a minority of Sufis who reject this model. Uh, we happen to be amongst that minority. So we have a completely different way of looking at uh, fana. We we take it to go from fana fi aham akam. Uh, that's a word that means it can mean rules or uh, commands or order or judgment uh, and. We kind of talked about this, I think, in our last talk. We've um, touched on this here and there recently. Yeah, we've touched on this idea, the first fana, which is, uh, this is what happens when your ego confronts the great lie. Uh, and the, the great lie, as we like to call it, cuts human, humanity off from its destiny. So um, you can go back and listen to the story of the Tablet of Destinies, and you get a little touch of that. Um, and it relates. So in the old models, they talk about alam. Alam means world. Uh, and that's a way of describing not necessarily another plane of existence, though it's often meant as that, but uh, a way of creating your reality tunnel. And this fana uh, is related to the alam al-asjam. Asjam means bodies. Um, when you begin to Okay, this, think of it like this. Let me give you a little simile. One day you wake up and you wake up and you walk down the street and you realize that you have fallen into a John Carpenter movie and everybody around you is zombies. Or they're asleep. They're sleepwalkers. And when you talk to them, you're not really having a conversation with them. You you say something to them that, that stimulates their dream and they reply to their dream image, whatever it is that they're putting on you. Mm -hmm. And that is a shock. And it makes you want to get away from it. You go, oh my God. Everyone around me is asleep, and here I am awake, and I don't know what to do with this. Fortunately, you'll go back to sleep fairly quickly in most cases, but you might wake up again, and you'll experience this again to the point where you will become, the matrix will lose its shine. You will not want to be a part of that anymore. 
And this is where you find your question, whatever it is. It might be, what is the truth? That's a, a very popular question at this point. Or, who are you? Who am I? Ramana Maharishi used that question to bring himself to full awakening and suggested that others might like to do that too. But that's where you, you find the burning question that drives you to the point where you can't not find an answer to it. So in a sense, this is... Uh, the annihilation of the desire to be in the dream. Mm -hmm. And they say this is not a true annihilation. The first true annihilation is the second stage, which we call uh, Fana al-Afal. Afal is, it's an interesting word. I know it from the Persian, and I'm pretty sure they got it from the Arabic, but um, I didn't get a chance to look it up from the Arabic. And uh, it means the doing. Sometimes it means the forgetting. But in this case, uh, the doing. Annihilation of the doing. And... Uh, This has to do with pulling away from the dream world. Uh, we call it alam al-arwa. And this comes from the same root as ruh. And it can be translated as the world of spirits or the world of ghosts even. And it's not a true awakening. This is where you realize that your inner world is... Uh, as illusionary as the outer world is. The inner world is just as full of sleep. And the entities of your inner world, inner world um, are very much asleep. And this, uh, we kind of addressed this last week. And this is the point where the the moment where you wake up in the dream you're in the dream world and all of a sudden you're awake it's like having a lucid dream but in a waking state and we call that fana al tanwim um, tanwim uh, is a funny word it can be translated as ecstasy but it mostly means being in a trance if you look up hypnosis in an Arabic dic dictionary, you find that word or a variation of it. Uh, I think the full word for hypnosis translates as magnetic trance because it goes back to, to mesmer and such things. And no doubt some fool is going to ask me if I, uh, why I didn't just give Gurdjieff's definition of hypnosis and mesmer. And this is why. So, when you experience this, you have a problem because you cannot unexperience it. Think about that for a second. When you wake up, to the sleep of your own inner world, to your own ghosts and entities, to the uh, thousand eyes that run through you and are all asleep and all running their little habits, you cannot unsee that. You know what I mean, right? It's like you look at the the various multiphasic uh, illusions that you you draw so that 
You look at it one way and it's a young woman and you look at it another way and it's an old woman or it's a rabbit or a duck, depending on how you look at it. And once you see it, you can't unsee that. You can never not see both of them. And it's not true that you can't never not see both of them, but you have to put yourself into such a deep trance to forget that you've seen it, that you'll probably never come back out. And this is a problem. This is what happens, though. This happens on a regular basis. If you go to any hardcore evangelical church of any denomination or any religion, Christian, Jewish, Islamic, Hindu, whatever, fundamentalist, it's full of people who had this revelation and then buried themselves in their own unconsciousness to get away with it away from it because they couldn't deal with it this is one of the dangers of this but they have to make themselves more and more rigid in order to keep the knowledge their own knowledge away from themselves so at that point it's like if you choose to go that route or if you fall into that route it is a self-abandonment and not in a good way because you have to ignore box up cut away from these things that have been revealed to you about yourself yeah and after this there are two more stages of fana uh which we will just touch on so that you'll know that they're they are there. One is um, the third stage, Fanafi uh, Sifat. Sifat means characteristics, qualities, um, attributes. Ed has a question. Yes. Um... Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Can you expand upon what you stated in terms of the religious people burying themselves in their own unconsciousness? Can you shed a little bit more light on that? I heard it, but... Yeah, uh, let me circle that. around back to that. I just want to, uh, for, for those of us who are a little OCD, everybody who is that is waiting to hear the last two. And I'm just going to touch on them because... The, they are not about this talk tonight. Wonderful. Okay, so let me circle around back to them as soon as I, I get through with these two. So, annihilation of attributes. This is where your attributes are subsumed in the attributes of the divine. And then the fourth stage is fana fidat or fana fizat, depending on your uh, dialect. And that is the annihilation of the essence, where your essence um, is subsumed by the essence of the divine reality. These two states we don't need to talk about so much, because ain't, ain't nobody going to be touching on them anytime soon. Most likely, inshallah. Yeah, and we have covered them more elsewhere. Yeah, we have we covered them elsewhere. Once or twice. Yeah, but I want to focus on uh, Fanafi Afal yeah. and Fanafi Tanwin, uh, which are Tanwim is a subset of the Afal, is a way to talk about that. So, in the scheme of things, if one follows one's fate, and this is to address Ed's, uh, Ed's thing here, um, your consciousness will become more and more sedimented. Just as the, the body becomes more sedimented as you age, your consciousness becomes more sedimented. It becomes more rigid. Unless you do things to keep it flexible. 
and things that you want to move away from, like the experience of the reality of being asleep. I mean, it's one thing to realize that all them other dudes out there are asleep, but when you realize that you are one of those other dudes, you are the zombie, right? What happens when the zombie realizes he's the zombie? You either address that and embrace it, or you run away from it. And there's kind of no middle ground that I know of. So think about Think about something that you don't want to know. I don't care what it is. You don't want to know it. What do you have to do to not let yourself know it once you've known it? There's something that you know that you don't want to know. What do you have to do with that? And what does that do to you to do it to that? Yes, James. Well, I normally try and distract myself, and the distractions have to be fairly intense to keep the knowledge at bay. So they're normally unhealthy. Yes. And But they have to keep going. Yeah, this is how you get junkies and religious fanatics. Yeah. So the mechanism by which you keep yourself anesthetized is to become more and more rigid. You age yourself. The process of aging is taking your universe and making it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Until that which you had, you no longer have access to. We know this from the physical, right? This is what this what is what it means to be old. It means that everything is condensed you don't walk anymore you shuffle right you don't look out anymore you look close does that make sense yeah and if you want to take if you want to grow younger make yourself more flexible not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually. That is, yeah, you know, that is the process of you think. The more flexible you are, the younger you are. The more balance you have, the younger you are. We know this is true physically. I mean, you can determine somebody's actual physiological age by how long they can stand on one foot with their eyes closed. The stronger you are, the younger you are. Another way to determine somebody's age, can you get up from the floor without using your hands? So that's the physical side of it, but there's, there is the mental and the emotional side of it and the spiritual side of it as well. It is so much easier to believe a fundamentalist line. Pick your religion, look at the fundamentalist aspect of it. That's easy to believe because you are not required to think or feel or do. And all you have to do is remain asleep. We, on the other hand, are interested in waking up. And I've talked about the little trick that you do of asking yourself, am I awake or am I asleep? Y'all know that one by now. Very simple. This is something that if you wanted to have a lucid dream, you would use this kind of technique. I mean, you could use other things, but they don't work as well in my, my experience. So right now, 
Ask yourself, am I awake? Am I awake in this dream? This dream right here, this dream of earth, this dream of um, phenomenal existence. And you will be for a second. And then if you're like most people, you go back to sleep. There will come a point if you can continue practicing this, that you will receive a shock, a total shock to your system where you go, holy shit, I'm lucid dreaming in this world. I am awake in the dream. Mm -hmm. There are two stages that we look for. The first is awake in the dream. The second is awake from the dream. Mm -hmm. And the second one is much harder to get than the first one. Not because it is physically or mentally or spiritually harder to do. It's just you have to give up everything. With this, you give up uh, the doing. You give up these qualities that you have. And it, in the, the third stage, you give up what you think makes you you. But in the second stage, you give up the ghosts. You've heard people saying, oh, he gave up the ghost. This is really how you give up the ghost. They think it's the spiritual world, right? A lot of people think it's the spiritual world. I've been having a dialogue with somebody who is convinced of their own illumination because they are having really cool experiences in this world. They someone might call visions or like ecstatic yeah. experiences that kind of thing the rush of bliss that just totally overtakes yeah All of which is cool usually but yeah one of the the greatest with... believe it or not one of the greatest stories that address this because todd mentions that uh, fritz Leiber wrote uh, a great book called you're all alone uh, before him there is this fellow <laughs> called mark twain and mark twain wrote a story what actually was a full book uh though we don't usually be able to get hold of the entire book. Uh, it's called The Mysterious Stranger. And in a sense, it's about exactly this. So, um, James, do you have a thought? Oh, just um, just talking about rushes of bliss. I've uh, throughout my life had a number of special experiences, bliss and visionary and da 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 da. None of them made any difference whatsoever to my wakefulness or my general maturity or development as a person. They might have inclined me to look in certain directions, but they seem to have no real lasting impact on me. Uh, whereas. The two ex glimpses I've talked with you and Mushtaq about that seem to have an impact and they have some wisdom in it as well. But I've had like, you know, blissful energy rising up through the body, many weird synchronicities, visionary drip, blah, 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 blah. Never changed anything, never improved me as a person, never made me more wakeful, probably drove me deeper into to illusions, to be honest. Um, I'm going to look back on it. Self-deception. Yeah, that's often the case. And it's it's a funny thing because the person who I'm dialoguing with is probably going to do really well because people love the self-deception. They love cosmic consciousness, right? Waves of bliss. 
static experiences, all of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. When I was inflated by these experiences and really deluding myself about how I felt, people definitely found me more convincing in these. Oh, topics. sure, because it's they want that. Hmm. Um, Austin, you have a question or a thought? Yeah, just a second. What James said, I mean, spot on. Like, I, I've had so I've had several mystical, visionary experiences, and they've done very little, but almost like inflate this. this like spiritual ego that that i think we we all have as we all create at some point which is which i feel is necessary because it, it allows you to if you're aware enough it allows you to bring you to to this point right where you're like even that is one of these eyes and it's it's almost uh, alarming like it's really been alarming for me i remember we spoke and you asked me about plant medicine and that's kind of one of the I, I i hold some resentment towards some of my experiences and not necessarily the plant medicine because i know that it's going to show us the things that that we focus on um and it may be resentment but resentment isn't the right word but um just kind of kind of alarming to think that something like that can take place or even even these experiences have been very very illusory um i remember meditating when i was in the jungle and i was having this like incredibly blissful experience and this little voice tells me like that's not it and immediately like i would say 30 seconds after that i went into like this full silence i've, I've never experienced that again but it was just like this i retracted my awareness and was able to see um how thought was was the mechanism of thought but but still it's like why why do we fall so easily for these for these experiences and and yes it is a really good question i think and the the trouble is is that these experiences as powerful as they are can totally uh entrap us yes and yeah. What I was going to say is, my opinion is that every experience has something potentially to teach us in the right light, right? Yeah. So it's not that these experiences are always and forever useless, but how do we hold them lightly? And how do we engage with them in a way that doesn't allow them to become the whole story, the end of the journey? I think that's what's most important to not get, I always say this, to not get stuck there. Yeah. And getting stuck there is one of the easiest traps to fall into. And it happens so commonly. I feel like yeah. there is a lack of education around the fact that these experiences, cool, awe-striking as they can be, world-changing as they can be, we need to be educated to the fact that that's not the end all be all that's not the end of the book you right keep reading <laughs> right i i also think the education of that would it, it like it's it, i heard this quote when i was younger it's like not everybody's ready for for truth and so even the education of that would imply like, you know, you can't really fall into that. And then one ear out the other. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's true. Even if you're searching for the truth, you don't necessarily deal with it well when you find it. And I, I will give you an example of, from my own life. I had my first initial awakening when I was 13. And I had no business having this awakening, none at all. And there was nobody around me to give me the kind of guidance that I needed. So I spent the next 
10 years trying to get back to this experience. It was one of these things where the universe blows open and you experience your connection to everything. You are looking out through every eye, you're hearing through every ear, you're sensing through every skin, and you experience the oneness of everything. And for 10 years, I thought, I want to get back there. I want to get back there. I want to get back there. Consequently, I could not get on with my life in the way I should have. Finally, this old Sufi says, dude, you can't get back there. There is there. Past is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. You would have to go back in the past to get to that. Be here now. You know, like that silly hippie used to say. He actually said silly hippie. Um, and he was right. And it wasn't until there was somebody mature enough to let me know that I was chasing a ghost and this gets back to uh this third stage or the second stage um this was the ghost that i was chasing it was a spirit that is not real something that was literally dead that i was trying to keep alive and um it was revelatory for me to go Oh, damn. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. We got a bunch of hands up, we so let's do. get through those. Ed has been waiting very patiently. Ed, what would you like to share? Yes, I have been waiting very patiently. <laughs> and we're proud of you. Well, thank you, Miss. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um things um i want to respond to what you just said Mustafa, but i also want to ask the question once one is in this awakened state what can one do chop wood carry water beyond that is there anything beyond that that's the question as far as i can tell if you remain in the dream even if you are awake in the dream you were at the chopping wood carrying water driving the car taking out the garbage stage you live your life but you live your life from an awake state the only other thing you can do is wake up from the dream in which case um the game is over Meaning? Meaning literally that. You wake up from the dream, you're probably not going to survive all that long because there's nothing holding you here. Oof. Which is okay. You know, it's it's like the, the drifting off into nirvana. Nirvana, of course, means extinction. Mm. So, living... A life awake in the dream is like the bodhisattva vow. Living a life that uh, awakes from the dream is like the Buddha going to nirvana. That's that's my take of it, on it now. But I have no interest personally in waking up from the dream at this point. You know, I think of that as... Uh, your last moments of life is where you do that. The point where you're like, okay, I'm yeah. all set. Time to go. I've and you see that, you know, I remember uh, this Balinese artist who at 103 decided that he was, he was done. He was, he was complete. And so he finished his last piece of art, which was exquisite. And he called his family together and he said, I have loved hanging out with all of you. Then he closed his eyes and he died. He just let go. Mm. Can't can't do it better than that. So here's the thing. With all of that said, you can see why some people do not value waking up in the dream. Think it's boring. They're like, what about the magical powers that I wanted? I thought that was the goal. Yeah. 
the kundalini the kundalini wants to rise up it wants to spring out from your head and then you get all of these siddhas you get all of these karamat all of these blessings all of these yeah. charismatic powers yeah and no you don't if you want to have have all of the blessings and charismatic powers you got to stay asleep in the dream all right there's there there is a corollary to that but i'm not going to get into that tonight maybe we should uh Bookmark that for later. Yeah, I talked about that once a long time ago. We had a, a conversation about that in one of these talks, and it was one of our least popular talks. <laughs> okay, right. Alka, I think, is next. Yes. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ms. Tak. Um, I just wanted to go back to that question where everybody was talking about their experiences. Um, and not sure I should say the name of the person. We all know. Not unless we, they're here. Say it again. Yeah, we should not, not say it. Not unless they're here because they yeah, can't. Yeah, yeah. So. All right. So I was having a talk uh, with him. He's also a teacher. And asked him the same question. Why do we experience these blissful experiences? Um, and he, I really loved his answer. He said, so that when you're awake, it's easier to believe in that awake state because you've had these glimpses of something that was not your five senses. And I thought that was a beautiful answer. Uh, it really helped. Yeah, it's yeah. as good an answer as any. Yeah, true. And there's but nothing I, to argue with, about with it. Yeah. It's like, sure, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so that you can believe when it actually happens. It's easier. So anyway, I wanted to share that. Yeah. Okay, and I think Adrian is next. I just want to touch on that in response touch on to that. Okay. okay, go for um, it. I can see how that can be true. I don't think that is universally going to be true, but I think if we can, as I said, hold these experiences lightly, they can serve as encouragements and perhaps even as goalposts or, you know, way markers like, okay, something's happening and I just have to keep going as opposed to getting super attached to those experiences. And like I said, getting stuck there. I agree. No. And that's exactly how um, it helped me. Yeah. Thanks. Well, good. I'm glad I've had a, a similar feeling about it, knowing that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was disciplined about not being attached and therefore they were able to serve as way markers. So I'm glad that was true for you as well. All right. Thanks, Alka. Um, Osama? Yes. How are you guys doing? Um, so one of the, the things that that came up is in this context of the of the Sufis that the term itself fana is coming from uh, Al Rahman uh, the the surah where uh, the ayah that says Kul man alayha fan wa yabqa wajhu rabbika dhul jalali wal ikram meaning everything on it will perish and the only thing that will stay is the face of your lord um the owner of majesty and generosity and so talking about the 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 difference in experiencing a state kind of what we've been talking about and actually having it establish itself as fanat or as a station where a conversation is no longer the conversation is no longer needed at that point for that for the for the individual person 
right? Because it's it's no longer in doubt or in question. That state has established itself. That fanat fil ahkam, um, the annihilation in of order or in discipline, right? If I'm a martial artist and all these movements of different discipline. I've went through discipline enough so that the movements are just part of me. It's no longer a state. I might have beginner's luck in the beginning that I've experienced some kind of like I did something like, you know, some crazy move and like the teacher were like, oh, damn, like what? <laughs> you know, but that's a beginner's luck where when it's established through discipline, that's it. That fanat has established. It's no longer kind of like what Mustaq, what you said. It, it's you can't undo it. It's that's it. They establish itself. Um, same thing with fana, um, fana il afal in in actions. Where now? So this is interesting because I was um, in a group discussion yesterday, and we we're talking about something similar. That before going into the attributes, which most of the time in the community, this is something that even find it, you know, for myself, it's really, you know, I want to establish a certain attributes. I want to call upon the the peaceful. I want to call, call upon the merciful, the lover, da da da. da. But in reality, having established al fa'al, this divine name, um, the actor, the agent the cause, having that being established so that now when I'm walking around in the world, when I'm engaging in relationships and everything that is happening to me and for me in this world is seen through this lens of al-fa'al, the actor, the agent. Everything is coming through that cause. And again, that can be experienced through a state However, when the station of Fana has established itself, nothing remains but the face of the beloved. It, that's it. No more. Right? So I think just making the distinctions between experiencing the state and establishing the station, that's where the work of, yes. uh, that's really taking place. Sorry. Thanks, Osama. Thank you. Okay, we have Adrian. I think has been waiting patiently. And hi, Cherie. Hi. Sorry about this. Don't be sorry. I'm okay. I'm delighted that you made it. I figured you would still be there paddling across your living room. I'm still working on it. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk more. Yep. In a little while. But Adrian, you had thoughts. Uh, hi, friends. Good evening. Well, yes, uh, actually, that uh, that's kind of my personal experience and how my journey started when I was a kid. I had like this uh, realization when I was like, I don't know, 11, 12, early, early teenage, that there was something that I forgot that was that I needed terribly to to remember. And this feeling was puzzling me for years. And uh, it was like, uh, whatever I'm seeing is not the whole thing. And, or uh, it was a very strong feeling about it. And then years later, it became more like I found my own way and started doing my, my thing. and. And uh, somehow I, I felt like a, it was kind of, I was in the progress to, to have that need fulfilled. Uh, you were mentioning about uh, James was telling it and uh, your friend Austin too. I feel very much identified with that kind of uh, realization where you have those experiences and they have no further meaning. Yeah. They are just there. And they they actually become like like an annoying appendix 
of something that is actually not reading, not, not, not leading you anywhere. So there, mm -hmm. when I asked someone about, about what, what this means and what should I do with it, because I didn't know what to do with it, if I would have to do something about it or not, um, this person told me, just let it go, let it go. And I was shocked because I thought it was so important, you know. And it was something so peculiar that was happening to me, 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 me. And, uh, and then, you know, kind of uh, learned to, to let it go. It's still haunting me sometimes, you know, but uh, not, not as, or I tried not to pay attention. When it came, comes to me as a, when you, you know, Stuck was, uh, were saying, uh, about the the once achieving that that uh, awakening from the dream but still in the dream uh the only thing that occurs to me that that would be just be at service man you know yes you you are awake or you can see how things are going and what comes next well it's depending upon grace of course your personal effort you know, but it really doesn't depend on, on us in, in, a, in a sense. You know? I do believe in a certain uh, weird way of destiny, or uh, I don't know even how to explain that. And uh, that being at service for me, for now, because I'm not there, I imagine as being like a good purpose, you know. By doing what I do, or by doing something else that's going to be revealed whenever the time comes, or whatever. You know? So, just wanted to share that. And I find this a fascinating topic, really. And uh, as you well said, this is pretty much why we're all here, right? For sharing, Andrea. Maria, how about you? Oh, sorry, is that? Mm -hmm. I'm here. Um, yeah, I I um, can relate to a lot of the uh, personal stories of experiences had. Um, for the last three years, I've been I guess, exploring death, um, fear of death, uh, because of the health issue. And um, last year, in January, February, I had what I I described it as feeling Christ's presence, and it was with me um, for several months. And then I I thought that that meant I needed to go to church. <laughs> so, not being a Christian, I started going to a Christian church. Um, that experience of feeling. Um, what was a warm glow, feeling embraced, um, feeling held, feeling completely unconditionally loved, um, just disappeared. Um, and I found that um, I, I would I would say of my own experience of going to a Christian church that there is so much fear there of losing that connection. And so much guilt of uh, sort of a performance anxiety that if you're not feeling it, then you're a bad Christian, you're a bad person. Um, and it's really even the most devout, most uh, seemingly ecstatic person um, lives in a tremendous terror of losing this connection to the beloved, of the beloved abandoning her. And... Um, and abandonment being a wound of my own, when I lost this seeming relationship, um, I started to feel, what am I doing wrong? Um, and, but what, what I, and like other people, um, it's only, you know, it's taken me 
basically <laughs> about a year to let it go. Um, and what started to happen then was this fear, this existential fear of aloneness crept up. It's like, well, if I don't feel Jesus anymore, um, and there was this, this, this uh, sense of there are no other people, and there's only myself that exists, and um, it, it just brought this terror up in my body. Um, and I, I just wanted to jump out of my skin because of this terror. And it felt like dying. It felt like death. It felt like being sucked into a void. That was just, that's just how I described this, um, dipping my toes into this, um, trying to embrace this existential fear of, of aloneness. And that happened about maybe that dipping my toes happened about a month ago, a month and a half ago. And what I've been, I haven't really revisited it, but it's always there. It's always there in the back of my mind. <laughs> and um, what I'm seeing now is, you know, that experience that I had of Christ, um, that feeling unconditionally love. I mean, that's that just felt true. The truth, the nature of reality. That's just how it felt, and and it felt like it did need to die away. It did need to go away, because otherwise I'd be trapped in a religion where I'm seeking connection with something outside of myself. Um, that I will always fear losing and always fear being absolutely alone without this unconditional love. And so I see like the perfect rightness of it falling away and the rightness of the terror and the rightness of that fear. And at this point, um, I, I'm just seeing the folly of of going to the church, <coughs> um, and and I mean any sort of belief system or book, um, period. And 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 what seems to be what I wonder now is um, because it doesn't feel like there's a seeking happening anymore like I and I don't know where I am I don't feel like I'm, I've landed anywhere I don't know where I am um what's happening um but it, it does completely feel like it's it's out of my hands and the only thing for me to do is when I see myself being triggered or um having a reaction to something to just attend to those things. Um, but I wonder about that existential fear of aloneness that right now it feels like that's actually fit. It, it actually feels like I'm warming up to the idea. It, it feels like, well, maybe that's the actual truth. So we are alone and I don't know what to do with it but I'm just sitting with it um, that's it thank you for sharing Maria that's quite a journey that you've had over the last year plus what's happening that you've had to just sit with and ride out and I think it's really fascinating how you watched those shifts happening within you and it can be a process in letting go of these sticky things that, you know, sometimes meet us in a moment of need or happen out of the blue 
and provide us a bit of sustenance that is appropriate in its time. And then at some point we find ourselves letting go. That moment has fulfilled its purpose. And I think that moments of fear and terror can serve the same purpose that moments of joy and bliss can provide. It provides us, as I said earlier, a lesson, a teaching perhaps, a taste of the vastness of what it means to be, what it means to experience this world. And I don't think it's either or. I don't think that the true foundational reality is one of only closeness or only aloneness. It's, it's all of it. And how can we learn to hold both lightly? It, it does feel that the aloneness is more um, feeling like an intimacy um, and, and not um, like a, a solipsism, you know, that, you know, I am the center of the universe and everything revolves around me and, and nothing else actually exists. Um, but And maybe it's more about the like the all oneness of of our of our being. I I don't know, but um, I hope that you'll continue to explore that, Maria. And I'm sure as we all go along. It's going to offer you some, some insights that you'll be able to share in due time. But I, I, um, I think those experiences are definitely important, even the ones of being alone in that intimate aloneness. So thank you for that. I noticed we had a few people pop in. I'm glad that you're here. I just want to acknowledge you without putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, we'll put you on the spot later. Um, hmm, let's see what's in the chat. Whole bunch of stuff. I will. Todd has mentioned the book Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. People might find that interesting. Um, yes, Adrian mentioned a term in Spanish. I am not sure how to pronounce that. Um, desapego. Desapego, translated as detachment. Mm -hmm. Learn to let it go, talking about the, uh, the experiences that folks have been mentioning that for them did not seem to take them anywhere. All right, Austin has a quote to share. Just this, what is above knows what is below, but what is below does not know what is above. One climbs, one sees, one descends, one sees no longer, but one has seen. There is an art of conducting oneself in the lower regions by memory, by the memory of one, what one saw higher up. When one can no longer see, one can at least still know. From Rene 
Domal. It was a student of Gurdjieff. And that definitely speaks to this phenomenon of tasting a state as uh, Osama put it and allowing that to be a guide towards coming to rest at a state turned station after putting the work in. James. Um, just from listening to Maria, I have a desire to speak on this, but it's only going to be bumbly and isn't I'm sure I've read in literature there's a state, a stage where you've had real insight and you've experienced something that is transpersonal, something that's broader, wider. But then the consequence of that is you become more acutely aware because your sensitivity is growing. You become more acutely aware of the way you contract away from that, even inadvertently contract away from that wholeness. Um, and so therefore it's kind of becomes uh, a, uh, it's a development, like it's a positive development, but it's very discouraging, particularly if you don't have community, spiritual community around you, where you now become acutely aware of how your personal organism in its idiosyncratic way, it contracts away from the broader wholeness. So it's, it's a, uh, I don't know if this applies to you, Maria, at all, if it's relevant at all, but it's, it's a preliminary to a deeper integration or a deeper realization. Um, I don't know if I'm talking out of turn here, but that that's kind of what's bubbling around in my head from what Maria just said, that um, becoming acutely aware of the way you feel locked out of this broader wholeness, even though it is by definition totally omnipresent. I'm fumbling a bit here. That's just what's rolling around in my head. Mm. It's James. So, Mushtaq, yes. do you have anything you want to add? I know it's been a while since we've <laughs> talked about the topic of, well, not really. We've all been... We've been yeah, I think everybody has that. touched on this in intelligent ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm... Usually, when we address a subject like this, it upsets people. Sometimes it upsets people very much. One of the things I like about this group is that y'all don't get upset when we say something controversial. Whether you're buying it or not, you know, at least you're yeah. not, you're not doing a, a tar and feathers thing. And if you're chafing a little bit at anything that we've said, that is totally okay. Yeah, because we're smart enough to know that we're not completely and absolutely right. There is room for improvement in the model. Todd, you had a thought? I saw your hand yeah. coming up. Yeah, um, that is that, um, yes, I often feel uncomfortable and chafe a little at this and think that that is a good thing because for the most part, it turns out that it's um, something that uh, should be addressed and uh, various parts of myself are uncomfortable with um, being kicked out of their, uh, of their normal rut. We all hate, you know, we all hate waking up in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's a good way to put it. There, there's yeah. a one, there's a wonderful old English word that everybody should use called utkiere, which is the anxiety you feel when you wake up before, uh, before you're, uh, you're ready to 
and know that you won't be able to go back to sleep. You know that feeling. <laughs> what is that word? What's care? Um, and I, 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 I'm joking, but it, there's, a, there's a serious point there, and that is yes. that, um, that, that um, it's not a bad thing to feel uncomfortable with some of the, with a lot of this, as long as it's not so, as long as it's not hitting so hard that it's going to be shattering, cause you to regret. That's an excellent point, Todd. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, need shares. Very interesting how traditional fana, fanas are fana fees, as in Annihilation in. And the latter ones are fanae, i.e., annihilation of. It's as if one is an outs as it's as if one is an outside path, like a mirror, and the other is the straight inside one. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I th I personally think that you're you're right, and uh, at least within our tradition, the doing fanafi sheikh runs into some certain problems because as much as I have loved all of my teachers, every single one of them has been imperfect. And so if I were to annihilate myself in, in them, I get their imperfections. P.S. That's why we don't, we don't want that, you know, annihilating yeah. in us either. We are painfully aware of our own flaws. <laughs> well, I'm mostly aware of your flaws and you're aware of my flaws, but together it balances out. Yeah, exactly. So don't do that. No need for that. Yeah, At and that's what our teachers and our, our lineage have said is that it's not any individual, it's not any one ego, it's not anyone's ghost that you need to uh, experience in this. It is the annihilation of acts, actions in essence of connection with the, the external world and the internal world as something that you believe is real. Things like that. People's personalities, eh. Trust me, I've lived with my personality my whole life. You would be bored. So we don't do that. But that makes us heretics in the eyes of some Sufis. What's new? Yeah, what can you say? Any other thoughts? Last thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, anyone who we haven't heard from might have something they might want to share. Yeah. While they're thinking, let me reiterate the, the practice that I dropped just a uh, for a moment, which is acting as if the world were a dream and working to wake up from it. So when you get up in the morning, set an intention. Remember, you have Intention, attention, and presence. Set an intention that I want to wake up in this dream. I want to wake up today. And then anytime you think of it, check and see if you're awake. Am I asleep or am I awake? Is this the dream? Am I awake? 
and continue doing that until you get the result you're looking for. That's all there is to it. Act as if the world is a lucid dream and see if you can wake up in it. Jonathan. Yeah, we've most, most of us agree that it's it's easy to be passionate about a spiritual high state. And I, I believe most of it, all of us have experienced being passionate about being completely asleep and seeking uh, fun and entertainment, but difficult to be passionate about the basic awake state. But I believe it's possible to learn how to like being in the basic awake state. And that's really important because that's where all the uh, the work is done. And if you don't like being in the basic awake state, you're not going to uh, seek for it. That's a really good point. Yeah, you are dead on. Absolutely correct. And I love how you said learning to like it. I forget, you know, like, I think I said recently wanting to want, right? And this is a lot like that. You teach yourself. It's like eating vegetables, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, Ugh. but then at some point you're like, you know, actually, I can enjoy this. I can find ways to enjoy this and make it worthwhile. So I think there's a little bit of that that snowballs us into being able to commit to the work. So thanks for, for bringing that to the fore, Jonathan. It's very cool. Ian. Yeah, as usual, I'm finding it a little difficult to formulate my thoughts all that well, but I had a couple of, there was a, been a couple of things that have been rolling around inside my head. One of them for context is um, nothing as intense as what Maria was describing, but recently I have had a number of experiences where I've had glimpses of what it might be like to give everything up in from uh, in different number of different perspectives, which I find. I'm not sure whether to say disturbing or terrifying, <laughs> but certainly um, I felt that I wasn't ready for them, for that to, to happen yet. Um, but I don't discard the possibility as of hand of getting more comfortable with those ideas. The other thing is Mushtaq mentioned the idea of a model, and I was thinking that in terms of the map is not the territory. And one of the things I very much like about the way this group operates is that we get a lot of um, direct personal experiences which may or may not fit exactly with the model or the map. And one of the things I always try to keep in mind with any model or map is, well, what if it's wrong? Or what if it's incomplete? Uh, that may be partly because my initial degree was in physics and so we gone through you know newton was right to a certain point then einstein came along you know and i won't go through all of the history of that but scientists are always refining the way that they think about the world and sometimes with revolutionary consequences like the whole 
development of quantum mechanics, which was just completely different to anything that came before it. And I always like to keep in mind the possibility that that could be the case with all the spiritual models. Yeah. Um, the thing to remember about a map is that in order for it to be completely accurate, it would have to be the territory as big itself. and at scale, as yes. <laughs> as the territory. Yeah. So no model can ever be complete. This is one of the secrets to doing this kind of work is to realize that no model can ever be complete. Not even mine. And mine is pretty damn good if I do say <laughs> for myself, but it's not complete. There... If, if we know that, then we can take in new information as we experience it. And that's kind of what this group is about because every one of you brings something to this. And it's something valuable, and it's able to expand and refine the model. We're taking notes. We're stealing all your shit, dudes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So um, Osama has a quote, which I, I think kind of speaks to this. And thank you, Ian, because, you know, you, you are pointing to the fact that we are maybe at different steps along the way different bends in the road as it were but we're all learning we're all continuing to grow and to change and to develop more more nuanced or more streamlined points of view whatever it may be so the best we can do is to share our knowledge and to draw not only from our own experiences, but from our teachers experiences and their teachers experiences while always trying to challenge what's been passed down against what's in front of us. All right, so Osama has said, and this is a quote from Ibn Arabi from his book journey to the Lord of power. Revelation corresponds to the extent and form of knowledge. The knowledge of him, capital H him, from him that you acquire at the time of your, the knowledge of him from him that you acquire at the time of your struggle in training, you will realize in contemplation later. But what you contemplate of him will be the form of the knowledge which you established previously. You advance nothing except your transference from knowledge. That's like book learning to vision. That's kind of experiential learning. And the form is one. So I shared this quote. Um, I believe it, it's fitting to the context of, um, you know, having these one-off states that sometimes present themselves as revelations. And sometimes in order to explain or to... translate or to understand these states the only way we get to understand it is from our previous knowledge that we have it so we're trying to make sense of it but the challenge is that we're only making sense of it from what we already <laughs> what we already know um so that's why i um I resonated with the quote because when he said you advance nothing except your transference from knowledge to vision, when that happens, um, this now I, ha I have knowledge, kind of what you said, some kind of uh, read uh, book knowledge or whatnot, or even conditioned knowledge, right? Something that a teacher told me or whatever outside knowledge, pretty much. 
and I have this Draw. experience exactly. The only thing that's happening is that now I have some kind of reference point to what that knowledge is. Um, and I also like how he pointed that the form of this experience is one, meaning nothing changes. The, the change is this internal subtle um, change. So that's why I, I thought of this, this quote as, um, as you guys were sharing. Thank you, Osama. I think that's useful. And it's a, it's a really good thing to sit with and contemplate about how that can often be the nature of the experiences that we have. The change is subtle. It's important, but it's, it's subtle. <sighs> Thank you so much, everyone. Nancy, did you have a thought? You might want to unmute yourself. I, um, I was wondering about how compassion fits into all of this. Because it's very easy to overreact to other people being wrong or oneself being wrong and you know in one sense it's zombies and in another sense it's all made of people and i don't know i'm looking at how to have a good attitude about this rather than just loading or withdrawing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how would you respond with yeah. compassion? That's an important question. And it's not rhetorical. I understand that. I'm I'm thinking about it. Um I don't know. My habitual reaction is to handle people with tongs so as not to upset them, which might have its limits. I actually have some similar thoughts uh, uh, because I try to find... When I see see examples of, uh, let's say, goodness just happening in the world, everyday people who are probably very mechanical um, and me just being very mechanical, but less horrible than it, I have been at times in the past, to be saying. <laughs> and I like to appreciate that. Um, and I'm not, sh I find myself thinking that I'm not so sure that looking down on mechanical humanity is necessarily the best perspective. It's one thing to factor in other people's mechanicalness so you don't get bitten by it. There's nothing to condemn them for it. And I've tried to extend to other people the same mercy I expect to be extended to myself. Um, also, don't factor in other people's unconsciousness unless you also factor in your own. Yes. Yeah. Prior to turning up here, I was part of an online group that really had a big us them we are awake they are asleep they are robots we are conscious kind of thing going and uh it was bound up with a lot of anger and frustration and uh defensive egocentricity mm -hmm. mercy is some is sometimes a lot more productive w without being naive you don't have to be naive or have you know rose-colored glasses on 
and there, as Ian was saying, there are the moments when people do creative, compassionate, kind, genuine things, even if they are surrounded by robotic habits. It's it's still there. I'm waffling a bit. I'm waffling again. But, yeah. But I think you, that was great. I mean, here's the thing. We have to be compassionate with ourselves as well, given the fact that we also have like our, our nice, loving, compassionate, awake moments surrounded by a bunch of random, seemingly random, seemingly toxic, hurtful to ourselves and to others, other behaviors that we have, right? And we have to be able to practice to improve our ability to be compassionate toward ourselves and toward other people that is part of learning to be awake being awake is not i'm better than people that is just more self delusional shit yeah guys i'm in the wrong group for sure <laughs> <laughs> No, those are those are really good points that you guys brought up i think that's something that happens so so often right like looking down on people and and i've found myself saying no i was so mechanical and then i'm just like it it almost it's almost like every time that i have that sense it's like directed right back at me and i'm just like you forgot to look at yourself they get check <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. nice reality check there austin mm -hmm. yep yeah, yeah, it's the uh, the moat versus the log problem. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I think Adrian offers a uh, judge less, perceive more. Yeah. And that's how you protect yourself, too, against sleep, others and your own. Yeah, and fundamentally... The only awakeness you can worry about is your own. Right. You I find mean, yourself going around worrying about everybody else's awakeness. You couldn't mm -hmm. miss as Grundy. I mean, it's the same thing you guys as... You are too young to understand that reference, I'm sure. That's the old lady who's always got her nose up in everybody else's business. Well, I think we all know Yeah. that lady, <laughs> that person. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? Uh, I don't know, man, but I think we all, uh, get the gist, right? <sighs> all right. Well, I think I have said all that I have to say. So time for your dinner. It is actually. Yes. Happy end of Ramadan, by the way. Happy Eid. I hope you all are finding ways to enjoy. Dig out. That. Yeah. Dig out with your friends. <laughs> Do all those taboo things that you abstained from the last month, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um. So. Okay. Zip over to gallery view. Yay, Brady Bunch mode. And folks, thank you for being here. You have all been great, wonderful, incredible. We love having you. Um, and we'll see you next time. And Cherie, uh, well, well, we'll talk in a second. Bye, everybody. Take care. See Bye. you next week.